I welcome you to today's edition of Get COVID-19 webinar series organized by Global Emerging Pathogen Treatment Consortium, GET. This webinar series is organized to discuss issues around understanding the impact and response to COVID-19 in Africa. And today we'll be discussing future of Africa post-COVID-19, economy, environment, and health. You agree with me that COVID-19 have impacted almost every country on the surface of the earth. As we speak, we have, we've had, we have about 7 million people infected and about 400,000 deaths globally. And Africa is not spared. In Africa, we've had about 212,000 infected people and over 5,000 deaths. But the impact of COVID-19 is not just on the earth sector. We've had severe effects even on the economy of every country on the surface of the earth. And Sub-Saharan Africa in particular is, is impacted by COVID-19. The economy of Sub-Saharan Africa is impacted by, by COVID-19. And going forward, COVID-19 will not leave the whole world the same way. So it is very important for us to discuss issues around post-COVID-19 and how it will impact the health sector, the environment, and how we are going to develop or revive our economy, especially in Sub-Saharan Africa, without destroying our environment, which, which is very important. So these are the issues we are going to be discussing today. And we have experts in different fields that will be discussing this, these issues with us. The moderator, our moderator today is Dr. Eugene Itwa. I'll be introducing him now and hand over to him to, to take over from me. Dr. Eugene Itwa is the CEO of Natural Eco Capital a sustainability consulting firm at the vanguard of promoting the integration of the emergent sustainability issues of circular economy, natural capital, low carbon development strategies with sustainable and green financing. So I'll be handing over to Dr. Eugene to take over. My name is Ayodo Tumabadui and I'm the Chief Operating Officer of Global Emerging Pathogen Treatment Consortium, the organizer of this of this webinar. So, Dr. Ij, the floor. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Dr. Dr. you can hear me? I can hear you loud and clear. Please. Great. Talk. Once again, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Good afternoon, Dr. The world is at risk and continues to be at risk of COVID-19. COVID-19 pandemic appeared suddenly and put a break on what mankind is doing with heavy impacts on all sectors of the economy. With regard to health, for instance, The most developed economies in the world faced and is still facing a major health crisis due to this new coronavirus. Despite their technological economic advantages, countries such as the US, China, the UK, Spain, and Italy have been struggling to put an end to the spread of the virus. Even with all the effort put in, all of us are fully aware that tens of thousands have lost their lives in these countries and the virus continues to spread. Africa, countries are not spared. But the challenge here is, given the weak health systems, for instance, in the African countries, and when you tie that to what had been with regard to peace and security on the continent, you readily agree that Africa is in their situation. 
the linkages between public health, societal well-being, politics, and the performance of national health systems are well documented in Africa, particularly in countries where there have been fighting, conflicts, protracted ones, and the ongoing ones. The COVID-19 pandemic is expected to hit Africa economies extremely hard. That is the forecast. According to the World Bank Biadra Africans Pulse report, it says as a result of the pandemic, economic growth in sub-Saharan Africa will decline from 2.4% in 2019 to between minus 2.1% and minus 5.1% in 2020, depending on the success of measures taken to mitigate the pandemic's impact. This means that the region we experienced its first recession in 25 years. The decline will be primarily due to large contractions in South Africa, in Nigeria, and in Angola, driven by their reliance on export of commodities whose prices have crashed, as well as other structural issues. Ladies and gentlemen, this will inevitably affect Africa's participation in trade and value chains, as well as reduce foreign financial flows. Today, it could be said that there have been gains with regard to environmental impact and indeed on climate. Studies have shown that emissions, pollutants, in terms of their concentration in the air, have reduced. The considerable decline in plant in travels have caused many regions to experience a large drop in air pollution. Should we celebrate this? Some economies are already trying to open, indeed some have opened, although some are going back again in terms of lockdown. But there are key issues with regard to Africa that we must give attention to. Do you think Africa is uniquely positioned to leverage its rich agricultural resources by improving basic infrastructure and efficiency and agro-processing capacity. What resources indeed are needed to strengthen the public health sectors? How can we continue to maintain the level of seemingly positive impact that we have got regarding the environment. Will the situation worsen? Ladies and gentlemen, we have experts in-house that will be talking to this very subject that has been highlighted. These experts, and indeed, I will also call them passionate speakers. We speak and specifically give responses to these questions. What impact will COVID-19 have on the future of the health sector in Africa? How do we ensure environmental sustainability as we rebuild the economy of nations? How do we mitigate the impact of COVID-19 on the economy of Africa countries? Indeed, ladies and gentlemen, we also give a response to this. How do we maximize the economic opportunities COVID-19 pandemic offers? Before the, the each 
of the speaker come up shortly. I quickly want to say that we will try as much as possible to maintain the time that have been allocated to us. And then we will also encourage the participants, our distinguished participants, to send their remarks, their comments, their questions, their observations through the chat box there. So for us to have a very beautiful flow, we will actually encourage that people send their remarks, their questions through all of that. We will take the first speaker. She is a professor of pediatric dentistry of the at the Obafemi Awalawa University, Ileife. She is also a member of Global Emerging Pathology Treatments Consortium. Ladies and gentlemen, this distinguished speaker has published extensively on ethical considerations in the design and implementation of clinical trials during the Ebola emergency in West Africa. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to call on Professor Morenike O. Folayo, who will be talking to us on what impact will COVID-19 have on the future of the health sector in Africa? Professor, you're welcome. Dr. Dutton? Is do we have a Professor Morani here? Would you want to unmute her if uh, she's available? Perhaps maybe we move to the uh, Professor Jimmy Adegoke. So is that my cue then? This is uh, this is Jimmy Adegoke here. Okay, uh, fine. So Jimmy, my uh, Professor ahead. Jimmy Adegoke, let me briefly introduce you, and then uh, you can come up. Thank you. Professor Jimmy Adegoke is currently a senior advisor with the Climate Change and Green Growth Department of the African De uh, Development Bank Group. He is a tenured faculty member at the University of Mystery, Kansas City, where he was chair of the Department of Geosciences, now at and up. 
Earth Sciences from 2008 to 2010. Professor Adegoke also recently served as chair of the Ministerial Advisory Committee on Agricultural Resilience in Nigeria, which was commissioned in 2014 back then. Now, ladies and gentlemen, we welcome Professor Adegoke, who is going to talk to us on how do we ensure environmental sustainability as we rebuild the economy of nations, particularly the African nations. Professor Adegoke. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, moderator. Um, am I being heard? Very well. Excellent. Um, I, I have to thank the 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 uh, the folks that the folks that put this um, session together. Um, there's several reasons to thank them, but I think uh, for me the most important reason is that I get to put a shirt and a tie on for the first time in three months. <laughs> so thank you. <laughs> um, we've all been locked down, most of us, and we've been working from home. Um, and you can participate in all of these things um, um, without showing yourself. And so I've typically not shown myself, but I have um, I tried to look good for you guys today. My second comment is that um, I, I am representing myself and not the African Development Bank, so I'm not speaking for the bank. In fact, in my presentation, which will be available to all of us um, after this, this, um, this session, uh, my affiliation is my permanent affiliation, um, the University of Missouri, Kansas City, where I work. So um, is, the moderator going to run my slide or should I run it on my computer and share my screen? What's the plan? Please go, go ahead and, and, and do that. Okay, so let me, first of all, let's make sure that we can successfully share our screen. Is everybody seeing my screen or is anyone seeing my screen? I have a PowerPoint uh, folder up now. Can, any, can everybody see it? Yeah, it can be seen here. Excellent. Okay, so I've been asked to speak to um, this environment, present some environmental perspectives for rebuilding better, rebuilding um, after COVID-19, as bad as it has been. Um, even this shall pass. And, and we will have to deal with the question of how do we um, recover, how do we build back our societies, how do we build back our economies. Good. So um, the moderator uh, in his introductory comments mentioned the fact that um, this has been a, a major issue. Um, so there is a, there's a, there's a, it's a, it's a health emergency, it's a health crisis, but there's a very strong nexus between um, the health situation and the crisis that we're dealing with and the environment. In fact, um, we have been told, and there is very strong evidence that this COVID-19 itself emerged out of wildlife. It was the, 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 the intersection between human society and the natural wildlife environment um, that resulted in this pandemic, you know. Um, so there's, uh, and there's this, this evidence that this has happened, what we call 
zoonosis, which is the, cross, the crossing over from the natural environment into the human environment of all kinds of pathogens. Um, we, uh, there, there's there are very various reasons why this happened. I mean, I am a Yoruba man. Uh, I know there are people who are here who are not, uh, who are not Africans maybe, um, but we like our, um, uh, our um, um, what do we call that meat again now? Um, wildlife meat, uh, there's a name that we call it. We love it, we enjoy it, you know. Um, and, and, uh, but that's part of, uh, so there's a natural connection between our daily lives, our diet, you know, and the wildlife environment. Um, and so, so there are multiple other, multiple ways or pathways for, uh, for crossover to occur, crossover of pathogens to occur. Um, our cities are expanding too, and where deforestation is happening, we're, we're crossing over, we're, we're impinging on that natural environment um, through agriculture, through all kinds of um, um, acti human activities. And then climate change, of course, is also a driver of this uh, in some regards. Um, so we have had evidence, right, um, from previous pandemics um, that were not as serious as COVID-19. There was MERS. There was SARS, there was Ebola, which was really mostly in this part of this region, this part of the world. And um, that was scary. We, were, we, we happened to have been in Nigeria just about the time when that was, uh, uh, when that was happening. So, so um, but thankfully that got behind us as well. Avian flu is another one. So globally, COVID-19, as at um, yesterday, we had, um, over seven, over, over, over seven million of, confirm, of in human beings who have been confirmed as having contracted COVID-19, um, and including almost half a million, over 400,000 deaths. So this is, uh, um, it's in our oh, lifetime, all over. Like, right? Because this in, was here. In you know what my major problems with Jenna? I told you. Okay. Oh, we can't hear you again. No. Somebody is interrupting. Can you hear me now, uh, moderator? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, no, good. No. So over, almost half a million um, of, uh, of over 400,000 deaths. So um, having established that, that COVID-19 is really not independent from the environment. In fact, there's, it's, a, it's twine. It's, there's a very close linkage between what uh, the emergence of these uh, um, pathogens and these uh, infectious disease, diseases. Um, so what's, that's, what are my key messages? Um, so the first is that linkage, very clearly. Okay, so what do we do about that as we rebuild? What do we do? about that. Um, and I think that um, what we really have to pay attention to, our governments, um, as we rebuild, is to prioritize natural capital investment. Okay? Natural capital is investing in the environment that sustains us. So Nigeria, for instance, right, we derive all of our oil, 90% of our economy comes from the natural environment in the Niger Delta. What investments are we making into that natural environment to ensure you know, that we're building re resilience and, re and, 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 and capacity to regenerate, capacity to moderate um, 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 uh, uh, negative impacts? You know? All of those are essential. And so that's my very first message here, okay? The second message is that because we are moving into this natural environments, there's a loss of biodiversity. Um, and human encroachment um, into these natural ecosystems um, is really accelerating the transmission of this, uh, this, this potential pathogens. And, 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 and that's the reality. 
that's the reality. COVID-19 um, just, just proves that um, and very clearly. And as I showed earlier on, there have been several, different, several other examples of that in the past. So how do we do, what do we do then as we rebuild? Um, my core message here is that you've got to design your recovery policies. You know, Nigeria, other African, especially Africa, because we, 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 we're not an industrialized society. We, we still, for the most part, depend on the natural environment for a lot of what we do. And I gave the example of Nigeria as one. You know, um, um, agriculture, for instance, um, sustains probably up to 60, 70% of the population of Nigeria, all 200 million plus of Nigerians, depend on agriculture. So um, it's important to ensure that you, we as a country, as we, as, 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 as we think about the next few years and the, the medium term and the long term, we invest so that the benefits that we we'll, we 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 generate out of our investment um, address what we call the triple bottom line, which is the economic benefits, the climate benefits, and the social outcomes. So every dollar Nigeria spends, every dollar South Africa spends. I was impressed. I was impressed. I was impressed. Sorry, Professor Adegoke, please, uh, the, those that control the, uh, the IT people, please, could you mute everybody? Yeah. So every dollar we spend, we really need to ensure that it addresses not just our economic recovery, not just the strength of the economics um, and the, the wealth that's generated through the economic activity, but it addresses climate, sustainability, and social um, outcomes as well. That's the triple bottom line approach to investing. And, and I really want to emphasize and, 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 um, and address that. So talking about the impact of COVID-19, this is an interesting slide. I'm just going to show it very briefly. One of the, the unanticipated um, benefits, right? Nobody thought about this three or four or five months ago, but global greenhouse gases have plummeted dropped down, you know, since between January and now, um, which is a good thing. It's a good thing. And I think our moderator mentioned that because we are consuming fossil fuel less, our vehicles are not on the road, industries are not really spinning um, and spewing out um, CO2 as they normally do. Um, so you can see that graph on the right um, really trending downwards. Okay, this is a study published in Nature um, just recently. So the government policies, the lockdown policies has drastically altered. And the key thing is energy demand, okay? Energy demand. And, and we are unfortunately oil producers uh, like Nigeria and Saudi Arabia and uh, Gabon and Angola, you know, you know and, and North African um, oil company, uh, countries like Algeria and, um, and, 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 and um, Libya, um, their economies, they, 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 they have experienced a massive shock in this area, right? Because of very low demand um, um, for oil and all of that. But all, what that means is that we have seen a 17% decline in oil. I mean, in, sorry, 17% decline in, um, um, in, in the levels of CO2 levels uh, compared to the average levels of last year. So, so that's, um, now what, what does that mean for us in terms of building back, rebuilding and building back? Um, I think that, um, and a lot of people agree with this, you know, that we, we have an opportunity to accelerate our efforts towards cleaner energy alternatives, okay? So that the stimulus money that we spend let us prioritize investments in cleaner energy, alternative energies. I mean, we have capacity, and I'm not going to spend any more time on this other than to just say 
that we, we have multiple avenues of doing this. You know, Africa is one of the countries that is blessed the most with sunshine globally. You have to go to the Middle East to, to find more sunshine than we have here, you know. So um, we can build effective off-grid systems. You know, that is going to, not, I mean, we're still messing around in Nigeria, for instance, with power, power solutions, you know, um, with, 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 with more than, with, you know, the Nigerians on the, on the call here would know, know, know a lot about this. You know, how do you solve that problem? You know, one of the ways in doing it is to roll out off-grid systems, solar-based off-grid systems, so that villages, um, um, all kinds of, um, you know, facilities can have access to regular and, um, and, 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 uh, and, and clean energy um, uh, 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 going forward. I think that that's a major opportunity that we really need to pay attention to. Um, also, as a result of this um, reduction in um, vehicular activity and, 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 and the lockdown, um, the moderator mentioned this earlier on, there's now a, a, a major improvement in urban air quality in, in most urban areas. Um, Lagos, unfortunately, doesn't really have a proper measurement system, air quality measure, measurement system. Um, so we are not able to get data for Lagos to show what it was before COVID and what it is um, during COVID. But um, 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 other parts of the world, we can see it. In fact, the picture I'm showing you now um, is, is visually shows the absence of smog um, during COVID compared to uh, prior to COVID. So that's a pro, one of the benefits of this COVID-19 situation. But there's a con as well, a negative impact of it. Several studies have shown that the effect, the health effect of COVID in terms of people who get sick and especially people who die from COVID, it's higher in those communities, those areas that have high, um, previous, previously high um, 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 urban air pollution. Okay, so if you have been exposed, if you live in an area where your exposure has been very high to, um, 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 urban, to, to, to air quality and, and air, air, quality, air, air pollution, chances are that um, your health outcomes are going to be uh, worse um, than, uh, than in other parts of, than other areas. Of. So that's uh, my, my, my fourth um, uh, 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 and really important. Um, this is an area of research for me. I am working with Lagos State Government, for instance, to try to see how we can improve their, uh, their, their air pollution uh, systems over there. Um, so so this, is, this is important, really important. So what do you do as you rebuild? The, the bailout money, the monies that, um, you know, you the government provides to, to, to our economic sectors. I think, you know, and a lot of people agree with this as well, that we should conditional, we should, we should condition those, uh, those, those bailouts and those soft loans that we are providing to the airline, to industries. To, they have suffered losses, yes, major losses. And should they be helped? Yes, the answer, the answer is an unqualified yes. But as you do that, let us ask that as you rebuild your businesses, as you rebuild your stuff, make sure that you are making decisions that are moving your industry towards a net zero emissions future. In other words, you are, you are, you are moving towards cleaner solutions, cleaner energy sources um, to drive your businesses and to do the things that you do. So I'd like to see, for instance, um, you know, all these banks all across Africa that burn, you know, who knows how much diesel that they burn, you know, um, every single day to keep their banks and their doors open. You know, maybe, maybe if, if they're going to get any help from government, we ask them, install alternative energy solutions, you know, instead of, um, in the long term, it might even help out in, uh, in terms of the um, bottom line. So that's just an example. Of, um, of, of, uh, of, of what you do here. So I'm, because of time, I'm going to stop here.
And um, I'm going to draw your attention. You, you can all read this um, if you're using your computer, but if you cannot, well, maybe I should read it. This is, this is the uh, President Cyril Ramaphosa, who is the chairman of the African Union, um, in speaking about COVID and, and, and recovery. He made two points. First of all, he says that we cannot depend on the outside world to help us because they have their own problems. They are dealing with their own problems. They will not be able to assist and help us as, you know. And, and, and his second point is that we need African money and African expertise to be mobilized in this rebuilding effort so that we, uh, we, we not only rebuild, we rebuild better uh, and we rebuild independent, we rebuild using our own capacity um, as well as we, as, as we do that, as we strengthen our, uh, our own African indigenous capacity to do that. So I'm going to end there. Thank, thank, thank you very much for taking us through all of those beautiful ideas and educating us more on the responsibility that we all have with regard to environmental sustainability. Thank you very much. Uh, please, like we said earlier, ladies and gentlemen, well, if you have questions, please just uh, uh, keep them and send them through the chat box and then uh, we can take them up later on. Uh, we don't know whether uh, Professor Morenica is available now. I'm here. I was muted. I think I was. I think that I'm muted. I'm, yes, I'm I know. I saw. I saw your. I saw. I saw it. But I and that was why we took that time trying to wait for you. Thank no you. problem. It's it's resolved. Sorry, it was a problem of getting on muted. I'm here. Yeah. Okay. Fine. So earlier I had actually read out uh, those beautiful information Thank about you. you. Yeah. And uh, just to say, ladies and gentlemen, if you are just joining, that this is a distinguished professor oh, no, okay. of uh, pediatric dentistry at the Obafemi Awolowo University, Ileife. Thank you, sir. She, um, she has published extensively on ethical consideration in the design and implementation of clinical trials during the Ebola emergency in West Africa. And I, I think that is very relevant to the issues we're talking about here, and especially since she's going to talk to us on what impact will COVID-19 have on the future of the health sector in Africa. Please, let's have your mind. Thank you so much. Um, I'm sharing my screen. I'm assuming that everybody is seeing that, right? Yes, every, we are all seeing it. Excellent. So um, I'll join um, Professor Adegoke also in thanking the entire team for inviting me. It's really just, a privilege to share my talks. Uh, and once again, these are my thoughts and, and not any other person. Briefly, I'll um, discuss in the next 10 minutes or shorter um, what we know about COVID in terms of its impact on health. I'll look at the good, the bad, and the ugly health implications that has come out of COVID. I'll do a brief discussion and then I'll conclude. So what? Do we know about the health impacts of COVID? And I'm sure many of you are very familiar with it. We do know that COVID may be asymptomatic. Um, the projection has been that about 40 to 45 percent of persons who are infected with COVID are asymptomatic. There are projections as high as 90 to 58 percent. And of course, there are those that are mild, moderate, and severe. We do know that the elderly are what's affected, the adolescent and young persons are less affected, and the children are least affected. We do know that men are worse affected. And this all have implications economic wise. And I'm sure um, the economists will be talk, telling us a lot what this means when our elderly, as well as the men, are those worse affected and worse impacted in terms of mortality and dying. One of the huge things also is that countries have had to learn to respond to the epidemic. We had very little external support this time, unlike what we saw in Ebola, where every person wanted to help. This time, the countries had, were left to help themselves. And we did find out that access to commodities was a huge problem. It wasn't only in Africa, it was a global health problem. And that has implications when we're talking about post COVID. And I'm bringing this out line forth so that we can generally understand what it is in terms of impact of health and then um, think about what the solutions have going forward post COVID. And of course, I acknowledge that's not all the list. 
it's not a laundry list, but I, as much as possible, wanted to limit my discussion to 10 minutes, and so I just raised the critical things that are important for me. Um, the COVID-19 has implications. It has good, it has bad, and it has ugly. And for me, the good is the fact that the country invested. There's no African country that has had to respond to this epidemic that did not invest in building a surveillance system. And that's excellent. That's really big, a big plus. It's something that um, the global health security system has tried to move for. And sadly, it has taken an epidemic for many countries to invest in rebuilding the broken down health. Um, surveillance system. It's not perfect, but at least there is no country in Africa that would not have tried to invest in building that surveillance system. You can do contact tracing, you can find cases without the surveillance system in place. There's something that happened. The second good thing for me, I think, is the country industry, a uh, cottage industry that sprung up to address the PPE, um, personal protection equipment shortage. You have cottage industry starts to make um, face masks, um, um, protective clothing. That's really huge because that is also an economic sector that will increase um, employment. But beyond that, rather than the forex that is going out to buy those PPEs, for once internally will be reserving forex and uh, engaging labor. And of course, um, surprising how it might be, um, when the issue of PPE came up and there was a lot of noise, I was personally shocked that in this Asian sense, we have people who still existed in 2020 not using PPE. And it's, it's because of COVID that people are all of a sudden learning how to use PPE. Um, but sadly, that's the story. And it's because it wasn't existing, not because it didn't exist, but it just wasn't accessible or people didn't prioritize it. There are so many things that countries have to prioritize. But PPE access is as simple as gloves and face masks, least of all goggles, or those extensive wares that you're seeing that you're doing in theater didn't exist in many hospitals and facilities, and healthcare providers were not wearing them. I think there's an increased sense of safety, and you find more hospital persons um, starting to use PPE going forward. I am not fooled by the fact that many of those gains might be lost. Once everything's settled, at least we'll have some gain, and that's good. And finally, for me, I think was the fact that the politicians also had a taste of their own medicines in the past, when it was Ebola, many people would travel out. I am sure a number of politicians and high place persons even found a way of sneaking out of the continent to get help elsewhere. But the majority had to stay back. And I, I am in Nigeria, I heard politicians saying they were not aware of how bad the health system was. We continue to talk about we'll get the health system, poor health system, they didn't know. But for once, for once, they, they, they did have um, to face up with the realities of what was on ground. Will that change things in future? I have no idea. Has it changed at this moment? At least in my country, it hasn't. But at least we can go advocating for change and they would not understand, unlike in the past when they didn't understand. So in terms of the bad, in terms of impact, of course, um, it's healthcare workers also need to um, increase. Now, COVID has to be included in the differentials of fever. I think that's one, it's a bad for me because in Africa, lots of fever has gained ground. I'm not sure people know that. It's not only in Nigeria, it's a West African problem and it's moving beyond the borders of West Africa. But even as a tease now, laser fever is not a high, healthcare workers don't have laser fever as, as a high index of suspicion. Now we have COVID. So they have to start thinking of fevers beyond malaria. Even right now in the COVID period, many people first need to diagnose COVID as malaria. There isn't a, a high index of suspicion when you have a fever. So we have to invest in the training and retraining to be able to help people learn that fever has a new spectrum of options and people have to have high index of suspicion, including COVID, Ebola, Lisa, because these are real-time killers, very short time. They don't have the luxury of HIV to play for years. So that's something. And for me, a bad is the fact that a cure would be found. There's so much international investment in, in, in finding a cure. But look at the range of cure options that people are investigating, including hydroxychloroquine. It is not produced on the continent. When the cure comes, we would not be producing it. And when there's another epidemic of a magnitude where our security is a big deal, we're going to have to cure to be able to assess. And one of the problems we currently have, even with the COVID epidemic, is that people even with HIV, because the, the production went off in China and those places, 
we now have a shortage in Africa and people can't get their drugs. So it's a big problem. But here we come, but we don't have any, any of the trials, any of the drugs being trials, none that's produced in Africa. And the same thing with vaccines. Certainly even the vaccine, at least with the, with the treatment, we are even getting involved in the clinical trials. With the vaccine, we, there's no single COVID vaccine trial happening in Africa. And then when it happens, we don't have a manufacturing capacity to absorb what happens, you know, when a vaccine comes. So I think that's a crisis in the making itself. And then, of course, the crisis was access to diagnostics. Many countries are not um, testing because they don't have tests. They don't get can buy. They don't have the money. And for many that have the money, because of the crisis now, you are having to queue for months to be able to get your supplies. Whereas if you had diagnostics in country, that isn't going to be a problem. So that is a bad for me. And I think that's a lesson we're learning and seeing. And it will be sad if we cannot um, address this. The ugly, which is for me, is the long-term management plans for PPE waste uh, management. Um, environmentalist, I was looking forward to hearing that. We're now going to have huge piles of PPEs on the lab, unlike before. How are we going to dispose this? What does this mean for disposal? We're not planning for it. And we're not looking into that. Remember when the pure water um, such it also started. Everybody was excited about access to clean water, but we did not take cognizance of the negative impact on the environment of what the waste from access to clean water meant. And I think it's also a problem that we might be seeing in the long term. How are we going to manage the waste generated from um, the huge PPE that's going to be used? I also think COVID-19 will cause an increase on the health system. They put the pressure because many people are surviving. But those people that survive have morbidities that are going to be dealt with. They're going to come into the health system, to new problems that never was. One of the problems with the health system is the ability, the number of doctors to, to pay patients is huge. And it doesn't make a human relationship good enough to, to qualify a health system as providing quality care. The number of persons living with COVID that is going to come down with morbidity and will be um, coming into the hospitals for care is also going to put pressure. And of course, the huge investment, sadly, there were huge investments in the health response. There were emergency setting up of isolation centers. But you know the sad thing, just look back at Ebola. All those isolation centers are temporary fields. They're all going to go. And that's billions of dollars that are going to go. They did not they would not invest into the building of the health system directly. I think that for me, it's the saddest. And it was obvious in Ebola. You have to strengthen your system before a crisis. You can't strengthen your system during a crisis. And this is what we're seeing. You look at the figures. It's all invested in temporary, temporary structures, largely, not all. Um, and for me, I think that that's, a, that's the ugly part of this. Uh, of this. In terms of um, going forward, I think for me, we have to unearth the gains from the epidemic. And um, this may partially address, as I've listed on employment, when we're talking about new people, new cottage industries um, springing up, um, as well as address income generation. And of course, it's to reduce the forex flights. But I think we must unearth it. It can go. We must build on that. And of course, for our healthcare workers, we have to train and retrain. And one of the things I think is essential is that for every CME now, that you must do. I think it's important that COVID-19 must be part of the training to be able to get recertified, including Ebola or, you know, or new diagnosis around fevers. I think that's very important. We have to start talking now about treatment, about access to diagnostic drugs, vaccines manufacturing on the continent. I remember that in 2012, African Union had this manufacturing plan. I think it's just a plan. They have, things haven't moved forward. I'm aware that on the continent, there's the African Vaccine Manufacturing Initiative that is trying to push this because you can't do this without government investment. It's huge and no person, no person, because it's a long term investment. You might not recuperate your investment in 20 years. And it is huge. Not only is it that the government must buy in bulk, so the government assurance has to go with. Um, anybody going to build plants. I know there are plants in Senegal, there are plants in, in Egypt, but this plant might also, this plant existing might have to be redesigned to be able to do COVID or any of this. And that's huge, huge money. So we have to look at that because we have a crisis in this respect and it will be very negative for us to look 
blind to you know to be blind to it. And finally, I think also it's an era where silo donor health financing is over. We've heard about funding for river blindness, funding for um, filariasis, funding for HIV, TB, and it's all in silos. We can't do that going forward. We have to focus money on health system strengthening. Once our health system is strengthened, we will deliver for all diseases. Once we're doing silo management, we will not strengthen our health. So the government needs to take this up as an agenda and focus on health system strengthening and erase donor money that is coming for silo programs. Finally, um, I would like to note that these are possible changes I've highlighted and my previous speakers has also asked for change. I, I don't know the next week I will ask for change, but we do know change never happens without a fight. It can't happen passively. It has to be fought for. And this also, in terms of health, has to do with citizens' rights. Always citizens' rights are fought for. I mean, it seems common sense that it's a right you should get it, but it doesn't happen. So the COVID-19 pandemic can be used as a springboard by income reactive results to start to demand for change. And when that happens, because it's real for, for many people at this time, the likelihood that we would gain from that would, um, would happen. And of course, that also means that we'll have to invest in the civil society or watchdog that can make this kind of bring and change and put on the pressure um, for us to be able to unearth the gains um, post-COVID. On that note, I'd like to say thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Moreni Ken, for uh, helping us to appreciate that. Uh, taking us through how the health care system is like. And uh, we cannot be strengthening the health care system under this uh, situation. I agree with you. Too. Thank you very much, ma'am. And uh, we will quickly move on to the next uh, uh, speaker who has traveled or indeed has been to 22 Africa countries. He has set up businesses in 12 jurisdictions and worked in a spe wide spectrum of sectors, leading to a deep understanding of what makes business in Africa sustainable. He is on a journey, and the question he always wants to ask is whether you are ready to take the journey or not the journey to success. He obtained his engineering degree from the University of Cape Town. With so many years of experiences, he has so much to tell us today on how we can mitigate the impact of COVID-19 on the economy of Africa countries. I would like to call on I Mark Glock. You're welcome. Yeah, thank you so much for that uh, beautiful introduction. It uh, starts to, it makes me feel a little bit old when I hear the kind of experience I've had. I don't know if everyone here can uh, can hear me. We're still getting we used to you. Some yeah, we can hear you, we can see you. Okay, good. So thanks to Dr. Jimmy, I also uh, wore a proper uh, shirt with collar because up to now it's been t-shirts. <laughs> I've been going from uh, home gym to home kitchen to, to home office. And uh, yeah, it's a good opportunity. And thanks so much uh, to the moderators, Dr. Doton for inviting me. We had him on a, a webinar here in South Africa. A while ago, and we do believe that exactly um, quoting uh, our president here in South Africa, that we need to find African solutions using African resources. And particularly in this time, we've seen that we've been largely on our own. I think the previous speaker has mentioned that. <clears throat> and indeed, trying to get drugs out of China, which is uh, one of the major suppliers of drugs into Africa, has been very challenging. I have a business in Kenya. It's one of the large importers of uh, medicines and, and um, diagnostic equipment. Huge challenges trying to get products out of India. 
In fact, at one point, India even uh, stopped the export of pharmaceuticals. So we were running out of basic medicine. Currently, we are not producing the full range that we could be. So definitely, I would take up that point from a previous speaker, that we need to capacitate our industry in order to become a little bit more self-reliant and not wait for other countries to provide us with, uh, with these type of medications. So today, I'm going to talk to you about the impact of COVID, how to mitigate it, some of the opportunities, and I'll do this from a perspective of the Johannesburg Business School. This is a business school at the University of Johannesburg, which is a very large university in South Africa. It's ranked number four in Africa. It's ranked top in Africa in terms of impact. We are very much into impact in terms of what our students achieve coming through the, uh, the programs we offer. We have something like 50,000 undergraduates, and the university is one of the few in Africa that improves its rankings. The Johannesburg Business School. I think I've got a presentation somewhere. I don't know if the moderator could share that with us at this time. Um, yeah, uh, that's all? Okay. So there we go. So if you can put that onto slideshow from the first slide. So I'm going to talk to you about uh, what the Johannesburg Business School does. And this is important because as we come into a, a scenario where we need to find solutions within Africa, we need to look within Africa and look at those institutions, particularly universities that hold knowledge and expertise and find ways in which that expertise can be accessed easier across borders um, and, and through to a, a more para, a, a pan-African type of approach. I'm born in Kenya. I'm a fourth generation African. I'm one of those endangered species there in Kenya. We call them Muzungus. We are the only three or four thousand remaining. We are rare, quite rare compared to even some of the antelopes. So yeah, we, uh, we are very much African and our heart is here. And when we look at you know, what defines you as an African, we have to ask about investment. Do you invest your time, your energy, uh, your future? Is it here? And uh, definitely that would be a yes for as far as we sit, yeah. So yeah, uh, a, a lifetime of experience across Africa has really taught me that we need to become independent. We can't be waiting for other people to help us. So I'm gonna talk about the business school. I'm gonna talk about SMEs. This to us is the key driver for economic development. Before COVID, things were bad as it was in, in our economies, generally across Africa for different reasons. The unemployment level, for example, in South Africa is currently or was sitting at 30% and it may move to 50%. This unemployment issue is the critical factor because without work, we can't buy food. We can't buy the basic needs that we need for our families. And the other end of the spectrum from work is, uh, is poverty. If we can't provide work in an enriching way that uh, brings wealth to our communities, we will never be able to pass on generational wealth if we are not accumulating it. So it's very, very important to we'll talk about that. We'll look at some of the strategies. If you're in business, what could you do? And then we'll look at some of the uh, leadership development models that we've been working on because we think leadership is really one of the key things we have to focus on as a people in different countries. It's funny how in uh, COVID time, people have been looking more internally. The fact we can't travel, for example, across borders uh, is quite alarming uh, for uh, a lot of us in business in Africa. But uh, what it also means is that the need to break down these barriers, and we have to remember that a lot of these borders are anyway artificial. They're colonial uh, in instruments, if you like, to divide up the continent. So the efforts made, being made by AU and leadership there are critical. We're going to talk a little bit about the development of leadership. So let's go on to my first slide. Next one down. If we can move it. Yeah. So the Johannesburg Business School is fairly unique in that it is totally Afrocentric. It came about um, after a hashtag decolonization effort 
within the university to transform our learning to something that is more African centric. What that means is let us look for solutions locally. Let us use expertise locally and develop the capacity. <clears throat> So uh, you can read there what we do. We, uh, we look at really action-driven programs, a very practical approach to our programs. And uh, we are very grounded in, uh, in where we are, where we sit, our importance, the context in which we are in. And uh, if I can go to the next slide, this one here uh, shows you the different um, programs within the Johannesburg Business School. We have an MBA, we encourage Anyone there who uh, wishes to study further, there's an online option uh, for that MBA. There's a weekend option. So uh, this is um, our latest edition. We have the Center for African Business that focuses entirely on initiatives across borders and the Center for Entrepreneurship, which is my discussion today really, is about how do we drive the agenda for small and emerging businesses. Uh, we have different also short learning programs and things like that, as you can see. So if I can have the next slide. Right, let's talk about uh, SME, small and medium enterprise. What are they? These are some of the South African um, definitions. We can talk about Nigeria in a little a while. So these are um, from, an, from a, a startup phase when they reach around $1 million turnover per annum, so it's a smallish uh, uh, enterprise, they are what we call qualified. And when they reach around a $5 million turnover, they are no longer small or medium. They've now gone on to, let's say, the large uh, sector of the economy. They should have assets of around a $1 million, and the management of the company is generally by the owners of the business. Uh, they are driving it. Uh, very often you might also find that where the skills you need to start up and um, generate business are different to those ones that you need to run a corporate. So there's a point at which it's uh, often a good idea for um, entrepreneurs to, to move on. Once they've uh, grown their business to a certain size, is move on to the next opportunity. We've seen a number of challenges in companies like Uber where that um, the attitude of the uh, more aggressive small business owner does not work in a, in a corporate environment. Why are these SMEs so important? It's basically because they're creating the work that we need. If we look at government across Africa, they have been generally bloated in terms of employment. As soon as you get IMF in to give you a hand or a bailout, they'll be telling you to start cutting down on um, on the number of people employed in government and um, very often our budgets are simply enough the tax is only enough to pay the employee the, the salaries of our government employees it's not enough to put investment into the economy so unless you're going to borrow money and pay that by uh, future generations then you cannot look to government uh, for jobs corporates and i'm looking at the top Johannesburg Stock Exchange companies, they have or they will lose around 25% of their workforce for different reasons. COVID is one, obviously, at the moment, but technology is playing a very important role with fourth industrial revolution coming fast. A lot of jobs are becoming redundant. Uh, industries are rationalizing. Even now in South Africa, we have robots underground that are doing uh, jobs that miners used to do. So this is the key thing. <clears throat> According to the World Bank SME Finance Department, 90% of all new jobs in Africa will be created by small and medium enterprise. 90%. Therefore, if that's the case, then 90% of all investment, effort, and policy should also be addressed into the ecosystem that enables SMEs to thrive. And in order to do that, we need strong leadership so that the initiatives can be clear, fair, and judicious. <clears throat> the countries in Africa that are not pursuing a very strong policy in terms of creating and encouraging small and medium enterprise are going to have a big problem 
finding jobs for their people. So here's the, the opportunity. We have, and I think one of the previous speaker, uh, speakers mentioned about agriculture and sun. Indeed, we have almost free energy from the sun. You know, in countries like Holland, they have to um, put artificial lighting into greenhouses. Here, the sun is there. There's a small cost to it, but it's uh, readily available. And land we have. People who say that Africa is overpopulated have not looked at the population density of places like uh, Singapore and other uh, areas. In fact, there is enough space for at least four times more Africans. The story of, oh, we need to uh, reduce population and all that is actually not scientifically correct. There is enough land. There's also enough water. And we also have the amazing ability now, not necessarily to invent technology, but to learn how to apply it. I don't think Zoom was invented in Africa, but we're certainly using it today. And there's a lot of other technologies that we could really apply even within agriculture to really create a bottom-up approach to economic development. We will need to have a, a direct investment into our economies. This could be diaspora money coming back. Generally, the first investment, I believe this was also mentioned, will come from nationals themselves. Because if South Africans are not investing in their own economy, then why will they want foreigners to come and invest? So the first thing we have to do as if, if we want to build our nation is to invest ourselves. We should not be sending our pensions uh, overseas. We should not be getting South African companies to invest in the U.S. Sasol has invested $14 billion in the U.S. in a project which looks like it's going to lose money. So, I mean, let's rather invest locally first. And then when we do invite foreign direct investment, which we need, there must be a link to technology transfer. So those companies coming must not, must share and encourage the transfer of the technology to Africans so that we can become a little bit more self-sufficient. So I think that's really the, the subject of SMAs. We could take some questions if they come up. If I could move to the next one, the next slide. So here's the thing about COVID. There's, uh, if you look along the um, vertical axis, you'll see it says there's severity and duration of economic, economic impact. We talk about the V, U, or L. The V is a quick rebound. The U takes a bit longer, one and a half years. And then we have the L curve recovery. At the moment, it looks like U.S. might have a V rebound. Well, that's what they hope. But it doesn't look like this... Um, the rebound is going to happen in Africa. I think we are more likely to have an L curve recovery. Why? Because we did not have enough resilience in our economies. We didn't have enough savings to be able to get through this period. People have used a lot of um, resources uh, which are required to rebuild. They've used it on survival. So that's going to be a real challenge. If you look along the horizontal impact, uh, uh, axis here, and this is uh, information you can get from the board of innovation.com. That's the source. You've either got, you've got uh, different industry sectors where there's a positive impact. For example, e-commerce is a sector that has really been boosted as a result of COVID. But you also have on the other scale, a catastrophic impact on particularly tourism. Now, tourism in countries like Kenya, Tanzania, uh, and down to South Africa are extremely important. They represent a major part of the economy. And we do not know when these tourists will come back, when they're going to be allowed to travel. And indeed, if they will travel, if there are still pockets of COVID in those tourist uh, markets, whether they will just rather stay at home. But more importantly, and this, uh, this touches on the health services, is let me say I travel to. Um, a resort in uh, Zanzibar and I fall sick with COVID, what are the medical uh, facilities there that can look after me? And this is the real challenge we might have and the reason that tourists may not come. So we need to really look in terms of our response, what are we going to do? We have probably got an L curve here. So if you look at the bottom line here, if we are in a tourist industry uh, it, <laughs> and we've got an L market, the strategy is abandon the market. And that means 
job losses, unfortunately. Yeah? So you guys can look at that and see where your businesses might be sitting and which strategy to adopt in order to cope with the impact or mitigate the impact of COVID, which was one of the questions I was asked. If I can move to my following slide. And this is the last slide in my presentation. It's really important to talk about leadership in this time. Where there's uncertainty and we don't have the crystal ball to see what's going to really happen, whether it's going to be an L or a U or a V curve recovery, we need strong leadership. Already indications of corruption and manipulation of tenders is coming through in, uh, in South Africa in terms of how uh, different funds have been utilized. There's a border fence that has been constructed to stop smuggling across the border with Zimbabwe. Um, if you look at the millions of dollars that were uh, put aside for that fence and you look what was actually constructed, you can see that there's been a failure in leadership. And this is really what I think we need to internalize as uh, leaders ourselves in Africa, but this is what we really have to understand clearly. If we want to get long-term sustainable uh, development and uh, economic advancement, we need to have personal integrity. What does that mean? It means we need to have the right discipline and attitude and mindset. We need to be giving people jobs on merit, not because it's my brother or my sister. We should be motivating others and celebrating success of others. This is the Ubuntu approach. What we do in terms of policy and uh, action plans must be relevant and appropriate. We've got to do stuff that relates to our context and where possible add value to something where we have uh, the abundant uh, raw materials. For example, in South Africa, you have gold and diamonds. And yet very little jewelry is made in South Africa. That is crazy when we are exporting such amazing uh, resources in a raw material form. There needs to be a lot more done in terms of uh, appropriate industry. There is not one black owned diamond school in Africa that really uh, teaches people about selecting diamonds, polishing diamonds, and setting them in jewelry, for example. So that's the kind of thing that we would, that's the kind of small business we would fully encourage. We must also build our nation. And uh, this is a controversial subject in South Africa. This does not mean xenophobia. It doesn't mean that all we do is look after South Africa. It means we have to build our communities. We have to buy local and we have to build local. We should use uh, leaders as mentors in our in our communities and we should coach others where we have skills and they don't, we need to be doing that. But in order to build the nation, we must build our village first, then our town, then our, our region, then our nation, and then our neighbors, and then Africa. We should be doing stuff that builds us. Um, often that will mean that uh, we need to bring skills in from other African countries, and we need to trade with them far more than we do. The intra-African trade is only about 15%. We should be buying a lot more from Nigeria, and Nigeria should be buying a lot more from South Africa. <clears throat> Why are we supporting European economies or Asian economies when we can be supporting our brothers and sisters? You know, every time you buy an African product, you're giving someone work. And that's really the message that we have to go through. This thing about justice, fight for justice. What does that mean? You know, as soon as the judiciary is questioned, as soon as they're compromised, as soon as the opposition party are getting locked up, and as soon as people are getting away with corruption, justice will not be served. And, you know, freedom fighters, uh, Uhuru, um, uh, Jama, it means that. Sorry, my need... law, you have a, 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 a about two minutes left, please. Yeah, uh, this is my last point, so that's a good uh, a good time. So yeah, we uh, we need to encourage the free press, free to associate with whichever whichever groups. Our markets must be open, especially towards other African countries. The idea of a passport, an AU passport, the idea of a trade block and 
uh, taking away red tape so small business can thrive. What does that mean? It means if you want to start a business, start a business. Don't wait for X amount of licenses. Just get going with it. <clears throat> and that's what we should be encouraging. So that for me, I think uh, concludes our two messages, SME support and leadership. So I look forward to any questions as we go through to the next stage of the presentation. Thanks very much, uh, Dr. Doton. I'm over and out. Uh, thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Ian, for that uh, beautiful information you just passed to us, helping us to appreciate that anytime you buy an African product, you're certainly giving somebody a job. It's a beautiful quote for me today. Thank you very much. And uh, perhaps with all these opportunities, that will be created, that is being created. Can we actually maximize them? Perhaps it's possible. But for us to understand and appreciate how it is possible, we have somebody to talk to us. He currently supports the Federal Government of Nigeria Committee on the Implementation of the African Continental Free Trade Area Agreement. He is a partner in Price Waterhouse Group, Nigeria, Financial Services and Industry Practice. He has been involved in statutory reporting, corporate governance, financial and operational reviews. And a number of this he has done across many countries in Africa and even in the Arab region. Ladies and gentlemen, I have the honor to introduce Mr. Tulu Adeleke, who will talk to us on how, on this question, how do we maximize the economic opportunities COVID-19 pandemic offers? Mr. Tulu, we are all ears. Thank you very much, uh, moderator. Uh, and my fellow panelists, I trust we're all keeping well and staying safe uh, in this new normal that we're all getting used to over the past uh, few months. Uh, can I assume that I'm, I'm audible, uh, moderator? Loud and clear. Okay, thank you very much. I think I will ride on what my fellow panelists had, had spoken about. Uh, we've heard, uh, I mean, uh, they've actually told us things around our health systems, the impact of COVID on environment, on SMEs, on leadership, what we need to do differently uh, in order for us to actually uh, fight or combat the impact of, of COVID. I think the reality is it's going to be with us for a very long time. I mean, the new normal is the fact that we need to uh, leave. Uh, as if this will definitely uh, be with us for a very, very long time to come. I think I have some slides uh, I'm going to share that will uh, talk through what I intend to uh, present today. Uh, an interesting thing for me was at the time I was trying to put this thing together uh, very early today. I don't know if you can, can all see the the slide, right? Uh, so, I mean, future of Africa post COVID 19 economy, environment, and uh, health. At that time, very early this morning, uh, total confirmed cases globally was about 7.3 billion. Uh, with Nigeria having recorded about 382 deaths, you can actually get this from John Hopkins CSSD live dashboard. A few minutes ago, I checked the same dashboard while we were just about 
uh, starting uh, this webinar. And he had risen by about 100,000. What does that show? What does that tell uh, each of every one of us? It tells us that the way the uh, pandemic is, is, is rising, it's at an alarming rate. So we've had uh, over 100,000 new cases between uh, 4.33 a.m. this morning and about uh, 4 p.m., less than 12 hours. We've had over uh, 100,000 cases. So it means that we need to actually increase uh, the way we react to this. A lot of things have been done by different governments across different countries. Uh, African countries are really, really doing their best in terms of ensuring that we react uh, to this pandemic. But again, uh, there's, there's, there are some restrictions that we're going to look at uh, some of this, some of the issues that also talk about uh, some of the benefits uh, that this has actually provided to us. In every crisis situation, there is obviously an opportunity. I shouldn't lose sight of the fact that even though, yes, uh, there is a crisis that we're all faced with, there are opportunities in here. Just like Winston Churchill said uh, some time ago, we must never allow crisis to go to waste. So are we seeing that, uh, that there are opportunities in this crisis that African countries uh, need to really, really turn to uh, some kind of uh, benefit for them? So this is showing uh, where we were uh, about 12 hours ago, but where we are currently now is about 7.4 million confirmed cases. Uh, globally. So what we need to do, uh, I know the experts around health and environment have spoken to us, but again, we need to pick our priorities. We can't fix everything. That's, that's a reality. Uh, even as individuals, a lot of things have changed. Uh, even in terms of our spending, you would all uh, agree with me that health is actually going to maybe number one uh, before now, it's probably occupied maybe number three or four in terms of individual spending. So the same thing has to happen uh, to different governments across Africa. We need to pick a few initiatives uh, as being determined by demand and supply. Because again, uh, there's been calls for hospitals to be built across the continent by different countries. But again, we can't just build hospitals that are not affordable. We need to look at uh, what's, the, what's the purchasing power of people uh, in Africa before just building something that is not uh, sustainable and that is not affordable or accessible to everybody. So there's a lot of interdependence between economy, health, uh, and environment. Uh, we're going to be looking at all this. So we need to also fix the financing part of it because that will obviously create uh, opportunity uh, for a lot of people. So what am I talking about? We need to be very innovative in our thinking. We need to uh, think about creative health insurance schemes and we also need technology. I think I'll uh, talk about that a bit later. But looking at the slide, uh, COVID-19 is actually the black, black swan of the century. Uh, a lot of things have been said uh, around it, and the speakers earlier had mentioned a lot of things uh, around this. What we tend to see every time is gloom, news of death, news of uh, people falling sick, people falling ill, and all that. But again, uh, there are other parts to this that we need to uh, really focus on if we intend to maximize the benefits arising from COVID-19. So the economic fallout is way, way worse than what we uh, experienced uh, a few years ago during the global financial crisis. Millions of them left uh, in poverty during and after. I mean, if there's anything called after COVID-19, because I believe that this is going to be with us uh, for a very long time. The pandemic will have a lot of substantial economic impact on sub-Saharan Africa. And of course, we have been seeing the various reports in terms of African countries will likely go into recession, a lot of revenue uh, drops uh, across uh, different countries in Africa, because there seems to be a, a kind of twin shock uh, to most countries that depend on uh, natural resources, especially crude oil, where the price of oil had fallen drastically before uh, the recent uh, rally, uh, and also uh, the impact of COVID coming at about the same time. Major global recession would happen uh, due to uh, this pandemic. So what do we then need to do? We need to focus on some pillars, uh, which I actually... Uh, stated here, we've got the economic, environment, social, and governance. And I'm quite happy that the last speaker actually touched a lot on the governance aspect in terms of leadership and rising to the occasion so that we're able to deal, we're able to deal with this. This pandemic is it's like any other pandemic. Frankly, we've had 
uh, maybe Lhasa, Ebola, and all that. It's just that the the impact, the severity of this is 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 is, is a lot. Uh, it's touched practically everywhere uh, globally, and it's shattered a lot of healthcare systems, even countries uh, from the Western world that had. Uh, Fantastic structures in terms of healthcare are really, really struggling when it comes to this, not to talk of a lot of countries in Africa that before COVID-19 were struggling with their health system. So this has actually exposed the weakness in, in, a, lot of, in a lot of things, uh, even in our economy. And I, I think one of the speakers mentioned that in terms of resilience, uh, we do not, uh, in Africa, have that uh, resilience as, as some of the countries uh, globally. And this has actually uh, shown everyone uh, the weakness in, in, in our system. So I think uh, if we look at uh, the various pillars, uh, economic, environment, social, and governance, just like I've mentioned, uh, these are times for organizations, corporates, and governments to think about uh, business continuity management. Uh, so in the last two, three months, what exactly has been happening? So organizations and government need to think about it. Yes, uh, there's that. Uh, that decision that needs to be made. Do I keep people locked down uh, for a very long time and not open up the economy? So there's a lot of debate around it. Why do we think people should be locked down? Again, a lot of governments are actually doing this to build that structure uh, for them to be able to deal with this eventually when uh, the lockdown uh, gradually uh, eases. So the next one is around supply chain. We're all aware about the uh, ripple effect that has happened to supply chain globally. A lot of things have been affected. I think one of the speakers mentioned the fact that a lot of African countries depend on China uh, for supply of most of the things they use. So this has actually been, been uh, significantly impacted. And a lot of things around fiscal and economic conditions of countries in Africa, it's been deteriorating. Uh, just like I said, it has been a, a twin shock of a uh, fall in price of food as well as uh, the impact of the pandemic itself. Agriculture and food chain, yes, were actually blessed uh, in agriculture, but that's raw agriculture. But in terms of the value chain from agriculture itself, how have we been able to maximize this uh, even during this pandemic? In terms of the environment, I think uh, that has been extensively dealt with. It's just that what, I, what we have seen over the last few months is forced on us. A lot of this reduction in human activities that are uh, let some positivity around carbon emission and all that have been forced on us. Now, when people start going out, how disciplined are we going to be to ensure that we continue to maintain this? So that's a very key lesson. In terms of social, uh, people have been more aware. Uh, a lot of uh, thinking around educational infrastructure, uh, welfare packages around the continent, and in terms of governance, so governments are rising up to the occasion to see how exactly uh, this uh, thing to pan out. There are a lot of uh, palliatives that have been distributed, a lot of things uh, that governments are uh, across uh, the continent is doing. So let's quickly look at uh, dilemma or decision makers. Uh, we've got issues of lives versus livelihood. So as government, what should we be focusing on? Should I be focused on saving lives from being lost or preserving people's source of livelihood? A lot of those things came across during the lockdown where people were clamoring for uh, the economy to be opened up. So there was that uh, key thing that needed to be, key decision that needed to be taken. Black swan or gray swan, we need to know uh, because uh, this is an event that is not expected to happen frequently, but when it happens, the severity is a whole lot. So we need to decide, do we plan uh, for how often do we need to plan for things like this? Uh, where do we need to devote resources in terms of uh, economic activity? So these are key questions that we need to ask ourselves. Business survival versus job costs. These also uh, are very important points that we need to also consider. Protecting humanity versus national interest. These are uh, key questions for policymakers. Should I be focused on protecting humanities or protecting the wealth, uh, standing of uh, my nation and, and population? So those things came through uh, when there was serious debate around lockdown versus opening up of economic activities. And as I said, every social and global issue of our day is a business opportunity in disguise. So we need to look at the benefits or the opportunity that disguised in COVID-19 because it actually should us the weaknesses in our health system and what we need to do uh, going forward. So uh, in terms of sustainability, I think a lot of things have been said about the environment, so I'll just quickly move straight to 
uh, the economic economic part. But in terms of sustainability, these are the things uh, that need to be considered. Uh, we need to consider the fact that you have to be a better steward in terms of the capital uh, that you are managing as a nation because you're managing the wealth of your, of your population. So you need to uh, ensure that you have more stewardship uh, in terms of integrity, in terms of leadership. You need to show this. Uh, we need to integrate sustainability into our focus and think about risk uh, management for everything we do. So sustainability of our actions, what do we do, how does it, how does it impact on uh, the other, other uh, communities around me, uh, other countries, I need to start thinking about that as uh, a nation. We need to adopt integrated thinking, uh, shifting from inside out to out of the box thinking. A lot of innovative ideas has to be uh, utilized from health, from environment, from economy, uh, education, medical, the use of telemedicine and all that. So we need to uh, consider all the impact of the immediate environment uh, to the other extended community. So these uh, are critical issues uh, that we need to think about. For every activity I perform, what's the value addition of that activity to the environment, to my nation, to other countries around me? So that's very critical because the resources will be limited going forward uh, and those critical limited resources, how do I apply them? So these are critical questions that nations uh, need to answer and governments uh, need to consider critically uh, going forward. So we need to pay attention as well uh, to brain drain uh, leaving the continent. Uh, loss of skilled health uh, workers across the continent. Uh, we, need, we may need to provide better incentives uh, to healthcare workers as we invest heavily in upskilling uh, those that choose to remain in the continent. It's a very, very key area uh, for us to consider as, as, as nations and looking at uh, the various economic impact. We also need to provide, uh, just like I said, access to healthcare for all Africans. How do we do this, especially people in the informal sector? Uh, someone said earlier, I think the, maybe the first or the second presenter, that this uh, is the time, time uh, you have three minutes more, please. Okay, okay. So let me just quickly go through, uh, okay, I mean, we've talked about the various impacts uh, of COVID-19. Uh, what do we do to stem the, these impacts, uh, stem the spread of the virus, uh, come up with a lot of reforms, uh, consistent support for the most vulnerable sectors. Integration is very key, ASCFT, and I think I'll spend about a minute or two on this. Then innovation and digitization is extremely key. Uh, so these are the kind of things that we should see based on the weaknesses that have been opened up uh, through the pandemic. Uh, so what do we do to maximize the opportunity? We need to focus on high growth sectors. Prioritize interventions that would give us the highest returns. Capital going forward will be limited, so we need to focus and prioritize. We need to look at the sectors that are more that are most vulnerable to job losses. We need to deal with this. We need to prioritize sectors and interventions that would contribute more. So we, we're, we're going to be having a situation of limiting resources going forward. So what do we need to do with those limiting resources? We need to prioritize the, the sectors that would provide the best value addition. So that's exactly what the thinking uh, should be around. We need to think about our debt and seek more funding. A lot of African countries are exposed, so this is an important area that we also need to look at. Digital transformation to support our old traditional processes should be at the front burner of every country now. How do we uh, build more resilience around technology because of the limited physical interaction of uh, people to people? So in terms of work, school, education, health, and all that, we need to continue thinking about. We need to leverage on our agricultural resources and use the impact of technology to create more value addition. A lot of uh, beneficial integration should happen through AFCFTA. Now, AFCFTA had a lot of prospects. Uh, uh, I heard the last speaker talking about if you buy a good from Africa, you create an additional job and you feed uh, more livelihoods in Africa. That's, that's true. If you look at the data here for uh, shortage of time, I'm not going to be able to go through everything, but it shows that there's a lot of opportunity in AFCFTA. Now, uh, countries are thinking about the use of technology in ensuring that we we'll drive uh, some of these things uh, through because it would create a lot of markets. Uh, currently, I think Africa entire trade market is about 15, 16 percent, which is very, very low. Now, this is making us open our eyes to the fact that we need to do a lot more in terms of regional uh, integration. And we need to, as countries in Africa, need to rethink uh, the how the works and uh, why. Uh, 
funding post-COVID-19. A lot of times we've depended a lot on uh, donor agencies, but right now, even the amounts being provided by donor agencies are, are shrinking. So we need to think about how we uh, utilize the limited resources that we're faced with. Do we think about domestic borrowings? Do we privatize? Do we think about public-private partnership? How about our budget spending on areas that are not critical? Uh, do we need to restructure the workforce and be resilient and be adaptable to the workforce of the 21st century that uses technology and digitization a whole lot? We need to negotiate terms that are favorable to us. We need to think about subsidies, a lot of subsidies that are not value-adding, uh, to the general uh, economy or population should be critically thought about and see how we can reduce uh, or eliminate some of these things. And we need to be innovative around our taxes to ensure that it does not become more burden uh, to people, but rather uh, it's more uh, beneficial uh, to people. So things that are not essential uh, can actually be uh, put into a bucket of, of taxes to ensure that uh, we, we uh, do better as countries. Now, I think I will end by saying uh, survival is the ability to swim in strange waters, uh, which is what I would encourage everybody to do, government decision makers, uh, strategic thinkers. And innovation is the only way to stay resilient and win. These are put by Frank Herbert and Steve Jones. And to uh, wrap up here, that uh, organization that I work for or that I work with, PwC, we have a lot of intervention that we're doing. I will set up uh, some uh, knowledge and innovation hub where we're supporting businesses, uh, providing insights and government in response to, to COVID. So we have uh, that, I have that uh, clearly shown on the screen, uh, which uh, we are actually supporting businesses and governments in their response to impact of COVID and working with businesses uh, that have uh, between five and 50 people to build their resilience uh, post COVID to ensure that they stay afloat and uh, do not uh, go down. So I think much. I will end my session by saying we need to critically think about the benefits and not allow this crisis to, to waste. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Yes, the opportunities we want to take them. Thank you very much for taking us through all the E, E, S, and G. Thank you very much. Now, uh, we will not uh, spend so much time. I, I could see that the chats a number of questions we raised, and indeed, our great speakers have already responded to them. I will just be selective of the questions I'm going to read out, and then all the other ones, we will harvest them, push them to the speakers to give response to them, and then share the responses with our distinguished participants this uh, later on. Now, one of it is, uh, I know, uh, Prof has been talking about Professor Adegoke, and some people have talked about uh, bush meat. I don't know how that came into it, but the key, one of the questions here is Professor Adegoke, thank you. But suffice it to say, before actually going to this, what has been said is to all the speakers that your presentations have been wonderful presentations. So thank you for that. And the participants are very happy. Now, the question is, is there an institution in Africa where I can get a technical training on solar and wind energy production, installation and repair for the rural community? Please, uh, Professor Adegoke kindly note uh, that. Then there's another question for Professor Adegoke again. A recent assessment of the economic stimulus and post-COVID COVID plans showed very negligible investment in clean energy, nature and resilience. So, sir. Have we learned anything at all? What can be done to make government embrace low carbon development? Then I have another question here, still for Professor Degoke. It's all, they're all talking about energy, energy. How can people be encouraged to invest and thrive in providing cleaner or green energy in an economy that our government pay lip service to solving energy gaps? whether for the rural area or for the urban area. And this next question is for Professor Morenike. What interventions do you feel are cost effective for Africans, especially from public health awareness and environment and vaccines and strengthening health systems? 
and what cascades should we use to defeat COVID-19? I will quickly mention another one here. Please, what is the prospect for telemedicine in Nigeria and what is your take on nature, pharmacy or hyper medicine? How can Nigeria strengthen this for exports? You have responded to some other questions, so I will not bother my head with that. But there's another one here for Professor Moronike. How would you advise herbal medicine practitioners to go about validating their products or claims in having expertise to cure some of these diseases labeled as pandemic? And then I have this other one, and I think this one will go to uh, Anne. I am an African-American based in Washington, D.C. What is the role and strategy for diaspora engagement? This has featured in one of our earlier webinars. And then I have this last question here. Knowing that business records keeping, which is a critical criteria for assessing grants and loans is a big challenge of SMEs, particularly in Nigeria. What would Aaron suggest financial institutions do to help SMEs in this regard to survive post-COVID-19? Please, let's give our uh, responses to this. If uh, there's anyone for uh, Mr. Tulu, I'll quickly bring it out subsequently. But we want to be uh, very careful with our time because we want to spend maximum of time, maximum, if it's up to that, of 10 minutes for the remainder of the program. Okay, I, I if have, any of you can just go ahead and take this. Let me add it with here. I, I have to actually leave now, and I just posted my email address um, so I can follow up with um, um, anybody who really wants to reach me or carry on this conversation via email. Um, um, I have responded to some of these things. Here's one thing I, I, I think, um, and this, this affects both, impacts both the telemedicine question and alternative, the green energy solution, the um, solar, you know, you know that we, just, we talked about, that shift. Um, I, I think it has, to, to, uh, it has to be private sector driven. Um, the role of government here is, is to just maybe provide, you know, regulatory and policy environment. But, but if, if solar is going to become a major, a major, source of um, energy in Africa, then um, it's got to be driven by private sector, all the way from small SMEs, as uh, our speaker from South Africa said, um, to, to big players, because the opportunity really uh, cuts across all of that spectrum. Same thing, same thing with, um, you, you know, the best example, as I mentioned in my, one of my notes there, is it, it, what the Obasanjo administration did those who are Nigerians will remember this, to create the environment that facilitated mobile technology um, 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 penetration into Nigeria. Right now, we're one of the leading countries in the world, really, in terms of mobile use because of our population, right? Um, all of that happened in less than a few years, you know, because we had leadership that created the, the enabled environment, and then the private sector came in. And, and, and they're doing great in that space. So I've got to go now um, with that comment. Your excellent uh, responses. We certainly uh, have gotten some uh, information from that. Thank you so much. Yeah, this is the, Veronica. Yeah, yeah. And I'd like to take that. Um, I think the issue about um, validation, I did respond. I would assume that most countries have systems for um, validating herbal medicine um, efficacy before it goes into market. I know that in Nigeria there is something at, which is the NIPRID National Institute of Pharmaceutical Research and Development that is dedicated for that purpose. And I am aware that a few herbal remedies have come through that route. So I can only assume, I don't know what happens within the system, but I know WHO as well as AU and African CDC have um, policies that support our medicine. So I can only assume that their countries also have, have scaled down those policies implementation. The second question I have is what are cost-effective responses for Africa? 
in terms of public awareness and to defeat COVID-19. I think whatever is cost effective will defeat every other thing now and in the future, including those things that we will neglected in the past. But for Africa, and, and also I'm weary about generalization. When we talk about weak health system, I can assure you that it's not all, every country that is, has weak health systems. Um, I know um, Botswana is doing well in terms of its health system, and I know it's a number of countries in North Africa is also doing very well in terms of their health performance. So it's not generalizable. But for most, um, the cost effective response is context specific and what responses will work is context specific. But I could always almost say that in West Africa, community system strengthening as part of the health system set strengthening will be, will be uh, a game changer. We have followed the European model too much where we're focusing on facility delivery, yet we know that a large percentage of our population go back to the community systems health structures to assess care. So we need to strengthen that and integrate it in an effective manner within the health system structure in a continuum so they can go out and in and out um, of, the, of both systems and yet get the quality of care that they need. We need to think through this. And I think it, for the many examples I've looked, those services delivered through community systems have really res resulted in huge impact. Those services that has continued to depend on facility are still on. Look at the DHS, they just remain almost flatline. So that, is my, that would be my response. On that note, I'll say thank you. Yeah. Okay, so over to thank me. You, I'll, uh, Mark Law, yeah. please. I'll respond to two very uh, good questions. The diaspora is really important. They have always and traditionally been a major source of income for Africa. If you look at the inflows from diaspora in countries like Somalia, etc., that's uh, people that are all over the world sending money back. But uh, sometimes we don't appreciate the size of the African diaspora. For example, in, the, in America, there are 40 million African Americans. Europe, Asia, and so on, there are 10 million African Europeans. You know, just compare that to the 4 million European Africans like myself. So there are many, many more Africans out there. And we seldom appeal to that market in terms of their buying power. They are 10 times, on average, 10 times wealthier. So it's equivalent of 500 million Africans out there as a potential market for us. And the kind of things we could be doing is looking at crowdfunding of projects. We could be looking at community project uh, funding as well uh, for social, uh, social uh, development. And e-commerce enables that all to happen. And the tools we have, modern communication tools and the platforms we have today, make it quite easy for us to engage with uh, people across the world. And you know, I think they, all of those American Africans, particularly now, must be thinking of the motherland. And how can, and if you catch them with a marketing strategy, they will definitely support you. I saw the Democratic Party leaders were wearing Ghana, a traditional clothing, a traditional cloth. I mean, what amazing, <laughs> okay, we can argue politically if it's correct or not, but I mean, uh, beautiful advertising of uh, some of the amazing uh, diversity we have in terms of products and innovation. You know, Africa is rich with cultural uh, wealth, cultural uh, heritage that is, is, it's a massive market. No one is really focused on that. So that would be my answer on the diaspora. Engage them to get their money back home, yeah? But proper investment that builds capacity and sustainability in business is better than just a handout. The handout thing is okay, but it should be capacity building. Yeah? And then uh, the second question on supporting SMEs. I mean, this is a problem before and it will be a problem going on. And, uh, traditionally where I sit, I see hundreds of business owners and a lot of them complain, oh, I can't get money, I can't get money. But when you look at the way in which they ask for the money, you realize there's some flaws in their pitch. They don't, they don't have compliance sorted out. Their uh, projections are not well thought out. The business plan doesn't work that well. So, I mean, there's a lot of capacity, uh, there's a lot of enabling we have to do as uh, business leaders and mentors and coach to help those young people put together propositions that make sense that will be funded because there is money 
there's actually quite a lot of money available. You ask yourself the question, who is funding all these government uh, loans at the moment? Trillions of dollars have been funded. Uh, America has taken on huge debt. China, where does all this money come from? There's no shortage. I don't know if uh, there's a secret wealth fund out there, but uh, you know, when they put out government bonds, for example, these are generally oversubscribed. The last bond they issued in South Africa was five times oversubscribed. So there is money. It's a case of making your project appeal to the investor. There's a skill and a technique. That's what we can help, you know, as business schools and uh, universities, we can assist you with the ways to, to do that. So that's my answer for those two. So with me, that's over. Yeah. Thanks very much. I'll Thank you very much. Uh, we want to certainly appreciate all our distinguished speakers. Uh, I believe all of us must have now one thing or the other that uh, we can work on. Uh, I would like to, at this uh, point, uh, uh, say that uh, we all need to, uh, uh, to be disciplined, like uh, was mentioned earlier, and not just discipline. I met, talked about it, and he said the right discipline. So thank you very much, and I would like to call on Dr. Dotun to take it over from there. Wow. Great presentations. Let me start by thanking our presenters today. I've, I've learned so much. It's like today's webinar is like bringing three different webinars together on one platform. You know, great presentations from health to environment to investment to economy, economics, and bringing everything together. And our experts have done great, great work today. It's clear that you guys really prepared for this webinar. It's not just coming to say, just talk from your head, but there was clear preparation. And I'm sure there's nobody that, that was part of this webinar today that did not gain something, regardless of your, of your skills or your expertise. So thank you very much, our presenters. You, you guys have done wonderfully well. I have to go back now and start digesting each of the each of the presentations because they were all wonderful. So to our presenters, thank you very much. To so Dr. Etua, yeah, your moderation was was perfect. Thank you for, for that wonderful moderation. Let me quickly before we go, two apologies. We'll spend like extra 15 minutes today. It is unlike get and it is unlike us. But you agree with me, the webinar today was just wow. And if if we don't Decide to stop now. We can continue to discuss for the next five hours, and everybody will be okay. But subsequently, we we'll always keep to time. That is what we're doing, kids. And second, apologies that we had some hiccups at, at the beginning of this of this webinar. I apologize for that. We had we had some few issues with the computer we are using to host the webinar. It's never it things like that never happen with with get webinar. It's just just something different today. So I'm very sorry on behalf of GET for that. So thank you, everybody. Thank you to the presenters, to, to the moderator, and to the participants that have stayed with us for almost one hour, 30 minutes. You guys are wonderful. Like Dr. Etu has said, we are going to have all the questions, and we are going to send them to the presenters who will give answers that we will share with all the participants as, as soon as possible. And we are also going to share the, the presentations the PowerPoint presentations with the present with the participants. Everybody that registered for this webinar will get will get the PowerPoints, and the the webinar will be on YouTube from tomorrow. So you, you, you can check on our website www.getafrica.org, and you'll get this wonderful webinar. You can listen to it again and again and again. So from Nigeria, I say thank you very much again, and have a great evening. Bye to everybody. Thanks.